if you're a parent, how do you feel about your child's development? Not just height and weight, but their cognitive ability, their, the way that they move through the world. Just actually today, Wolf walked into the bathroom while I was doing number two, as Harley Breen would say of his parenting experience, a few years of shooting with the door open. Uh, so anyway, Wolf walked in and said, Dad, I got changed all by myself. Didn't even put anything on backwards. And you know what? He he got it all done. Long sleeve shirt, you know, pants, undies, singlet, the whole box and dice. I said, do you want a hand with your socks, mate? No, no, I can do them. And he ran off and he put them on perfectly with the heels in the right spot and everything. He's four and there he is. I'm super proud of him. But at the same time, my heart breaks a little bit because that moment of independence, that is a sign that the little baby who looked it's up to me like I am a god. That little person is almost it's on the way to being completely gone. But that's a lot of the work as a parent, isn't it? To deliberately break our own hearts by raising kids who ultimately won't need us anymore. It is, it is hard to do, but that is the job. That's the job. As far as socialization skills though, Look, there's moments where we've got them around when family are there. We can help guide interactions like when, like, you know, auntie wants to run over for a big hug. You can help guide some interactions there. It looks like he doesn't want to have a hug right now. If he feels like it later, I'm sure he'll come over. He'll give you a hug. Little things like that, uh, they're really important because small things like that for a kid develop into a young adult who understands boundaries around their body. It, it doesn't seem like much, but it's actually a lot. But what about working together with other people their age? Unless you as a parent are around them all the time, which we know isn't great. It's kind of hard to guide them when they're acting and interacting with other kids around the same age as them. Slightly bigger kids, slightly smaller kids. Thankfully, there's a way that kids can learn what it is to work as a team, to share information with that team in a service of a common goal, and at the same time, become fluent and literate in the capability of their own body. I think you know what I'm talking about already, don't you? Yeah, it's a team sport. I played a little bit as a kid, but I played more team sports in my 20s. But I have absolutely seen firsthand the extraordinary benefits, physically, socially, emotionally, that can be gained by regular team sport through my experience with Georgia, my stepdaughter, who was 10 when I met her, but she was seven when she met my guest today. Liz Ellis is a former Australian netball player and sports commentator. She's about to host a brand new season of Gladiators on 10. Um, Gladiators ready. That's, Bo Ryan's going to say that part, but it's still pretty good. Liz Ellis is considered one of the greatest netball players of all all time. She's won multiple world championships, four MVP awards, Commonwealth Games gold medal. She's got a lot to say about work ethic, about resilience, about women's sport, and something we don't really hear about, but I, I know you're going to find fascinating, elite female athletes and fertility. It's a really valuable part of the conversation. I absolutely love this chat. She's so epic, and I know you're going to get a lot out of my conversation with Liz Ellis. How's your missus? This is pretty good. You work with my missus. I did. You know, just after I had my little girl, who's now 12, Audrey had to do my hair and makeup for a couple of things, and Evelyn was like a month old, and I was breastfeeding, and she was working around it. Anyway, and Evelyn's name is Evelyn Audrey, so Aww. Audrey was very excited about that. That is, that is lovely. Well, yeah, no, so she's- you um, really are Punching above your weight. So well done. Dude, tell me about it. I'm so happy to speak with you today. We, we actually met long, long, long time ago uh, when you were uh, in the netball game. You came into the radio station and worked that up in Brisbane. And I, I, I was just like, <gasps> <laughs> because I'll have you know, at the time, Liz, I was playing uh, indoor mixed netball at uh, Lang Park, which is no longer there. And uh, so I know the game, all right? You do. What position did you play? WD, a shitty WD. Defense, defense, defense. Yeah, yeah. The wing defense is where you put the people who just try really hard. 
That's me. I will honestly say this to you. I went to an all boys rugby school. Uh, I didn't play rugby except for when we were forced to in PE, but I know enough about how, you know, young teenage boys who are shoved together in that kind of space can interact physically. Mm -hmm. And I will say to you, I've never played a more violent game than indoor mixed netball. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And do you know what? You've been playing against women who would have played netball all their lives and they might not be the fastest or the strongest, but they're the smartest and they would have knocked you around. Liz, I, I would be waiting for a pass, all right, and the WA across from me would have her index finger in my mouth, have her fingernail against my gum and out again before the ref would even turn. And I'd be like, I'm spitting blood going, what the, what was, what? You're allowed to do that? And she wasn't trying and to take it at me like, like it wasn't, you know, some sort no, of, no, no, no. I don't know. She was just like, bam, like that with a like fingernail up, up against my gum. <laughs> well, like, you'd be pleased to know, Osha, I coach a couple of under 12s netball teams and we do not do any work at training on fingernail in the mouth up against your gum, I promise. That's just, okay. you know, that was just her special thing, obviously. Mate, I got squirrel gripped. I got everything. <laughs> it was just astounding. <laughs> I was a punish though. I was, I was a very old version of me. I was still figuring out my way in the world and I was – Yes, I was quite a punish, and so I probably deserved every bit of <laughs> physical retaliation that I was getting. So much fun, though. So much I fun. I absolutely loved it. When you, when did you realise that you were like, I might be a bit better at this than the other kids? Oh, uh, it took me a while, actually. I only started playing netball by accident. So when I was young, I was a real bookworm and I was uncoordinated. And the first time mum's friend asked her if I wanted to play netball, mum said no. She said, oh, Liz isn't very coordinated. She likes to read. Don't think netball would be her thing. And this woman, and I get up and I just genuflect in her general direction. She's passed away now, but every day I just am so grateful for her. She rang mum back and talked her into it and said, you know, kids who, who end up as juvenile delinquents have often never played team sports. So mum and dad were like, okay, well, she can start as long as she can stop if she doesn't like it. So it took me 27 years to decide to stop. But when I started, I just loved it. You, was, hang on, were you, were you, on a, were you on a path to rat baggery, Liz? I was. <laughs> yeah, I think I was. I was a little bit. I was a little bit naughty. I liked. I liked lighting fires when I was a kid. I mean, who doesn't? Who's not a pyromaniac when they're a kid? The yeah. amount of Lego dudes that just were emoliated in my backyard. Like, Mum, didn't I just get you some? I know, but we're out of Lego men, Mum. Can you believe it? They're I don't know. Where they keep going. Who, who would who should who would make Lego bits flammable? I mean, amazing. Uh, it, 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 it's less melty now, but the Im, sorry, immolated. It was it's less melty now, but yeah, those guys got. <laughs> um, yeah, so I must have been on my on a pathway to rat baggery. I didn't really stop that, but at least they gave me something to to do while I was, whilst I was becoming a rat bag. But I loved it. The first moment I stepped on court, I loved the competitiveness. I loved going to training, being with my friends. I think netball, it is the ultimate team game because one person can't dominate the court and that's something that yeah. I really liked and I've always liked being part of a team, you know, working on it with our own strengths and weaknesses and trying to fill the gaps and figuring out how to beat the opposition. So from the moment I stepped on court, I loved it. it took me a few years to get sort of coordinated and all the way through like when I played junior reps, I was always the second or third best in the team. I was never the best and that was actually good for me because it made me, like I'm competitive by nature and it made me want to work harder every year to get better and to perhaps be the best. So because I was never the best, I never sort of thought about taking it any further. And also netball wasn't on telly back then, you know, in the late 80s. So mm -hmm. it wasn't until I sort of hit late high school and I started to get selected in New South Wales junior teams, like under 17s and under 19s. And I was in year 11 and I got a, a letter from the Australian Institute of Sport offering me a scholarship and mum and dad, uh, we lived in Western Sydney, mum and dad never, like, dad left school in year eight and mum left school in year nine and they were really adamant that my sister and I would get educated so they were like, no, you're not going to leave school and go to Canberra, you're not, you're not even going to go to school, go to Canberra even if you can go to school there. They were determined that I would finish year 12 in Sydney and then I could make a decision around if I wanted to go to the Australian Institute of Sport and if it worked around university. So it wasn't probably until I was 17 or 18 that I realised that 
hey, I might be good at this. Once you got into the, the team sport and now you coach under 12s, what role do you think team sport has in shaping a young person's place in the world? I think team sport is so important in shaping a young person's place in the world and shaping their abilities. So the great thing I think about team sport is that it teaches you how to work with other people. It teaches you about responsibility to do your own job, leadership, initiative, resilience, all the things that you want you want kids to finish school and go into the workforce with. And I've got to say, like it really was obvious to me when I was in the workforce full time, I used to be a solicitor and I knew straight away when I was working with someone whether they'd been in a team sport or not because the key thing that differentiated people from who had played team sport from people who hadn't was information sharing. And I found that really interesting that in the workplace, if people had played team sport, they'd share information to make the whole team better. If they hadn't played team sport, they were far more likely to not share information. They were far more likely to keep things to themselves to help themselves at some later stage. So that was really fascinating for me. So I think all the great things that you want your kids to have as they go through school and then into the workforce can be found in team sport. And it doesn't matter what team sport it is. It really is just playing sport with a bunch of people who you have to negotiate and navigate your way around. As I mentioned, like I, I never really played. I played a bit of soccer when I was younger and I didn't really start to play this kind of stuff until I was in my 20s, which was indoor netball and, and rowing as well, which I, I did in school, but then I didn't like it very much. But watching G, I met G when she was 10 and watching the sport that she played, which ranged from everything from netball to basketball to water polo, which is, look, there's violence and then there's, and there's water you know, polo. Water polo. Like. <laughs> I've been, I played water polo a couple of times and I found it too violent, which is saying something. But watching the cohort of friends that she got and, and dancing as well, like she she danced, and it was the same crew that danced, that played water polo, that basketball, that they ended up playing soccer as well. These just gigantic Amazonians who just was like, <laughs> we just want to run. They've got a touch team now. Watching how she combined, you know, physicality with her social circle of people who didn't go to school with her it was just a superpower it, it is, really it? was yeah and it's interesting i coached my little girls um my little girl under her under 12s team and um, we started with one team and we ended up with two and the thing that i love about it is that they all went to the same primary school together but now they're scattering to the winds and going to seven or eight different high schools and this yeah. you're so right about about it being a superpower they'll all still keep playing netball with their primary school friends. So that means when things go to pot at high school, if there's fights or if there's something going wrong, they've got this core group of girls who will become a core group of women who they'll have known for a long time. And so then if there's an issue with your friendships at school, you've still got other friendships that are are different. So it's not the be all and the end all if something goes wrong or you have a fight. And I think that's so important. And the girls in my netball team are so different. We've got all these different beautiful personalities and at different times they all annoy me greatly but I tell them that and they're cool with that and like I just love that they will all be together and try different things and I think the thing that's really interesting is that these particular group of girls so you know I go to I went to the school presentation day the other day and I was so proud when the netball girls got awards I was like their mum I'm like yay go the netty girls (laughs) my husband's like sit down But I'm so proud of them because the thing that really sets them apart, I think, from perhaps from kids who don't play sport is that they're really curious and they've got this great confidence based in their physical ability. So that gives them confidence to go out and try on new things. And, like, I was really really impressed that, like, there was kids in my netball team who were getting awards for choir and music and art. I thought they're just, they're so confident because they've got this physical literacy. They'll try anything. And you would find that with, with G. Like, she... Clearly, she's got this great physical literacy. So she goes out and tries other things. And the other interesting thing that I think about that is that um, my younger sister, she moved up here from Sydney. And when she got here, she didn't know a soul. And this is how she made her friends was going to play netball, right? So you turn up to someone, you don't know a soul. You don't have to be a great athlete. You just have to be able to pass and catch or kick what everyone do to a like a, re- like a basic level. And that's a whole entree to a... Everywhere you go, she's gone to live in Hong Kong now, my sister, and all her mates are through coaching and playing netball. 
it's like a ready-made friendship group wherever you go. That's so. It's so. I mean, you're right about the physical literacy. It's it's. We teach kids so many things about. You got to know how numbers work. You got to know how letters work. But how your own body works and what you can do with your own body, what you're capable of, what can happen if you don't look after it. You know, what's the bad spelling equivalent of your body and what you can learn, totally. how practice can create something to be automatic. Yep. That going through life with that is extraordinary. Oh, it's so powerful, right? And if you've got girls who go through life thinking about their bodies and boys now too, about what their bodies can do rather than what their bodies look like, that is just a totally different outlook that is so positive and so healthy. So there's all these great things from playing sport that if you don't play it, yeah, you don't get injured. Yeah, you might still have your cartilage intact by the time you hit 50. But socially and mentally, there's all these downside or this upside that you don't get. Oh, yeah. I, was, I work with someone uh, yesterday who uh, we were talking about this sort of thing. And she says, Oh, I got sick of being upset that I couldn't be skinny. So I started powerlifting and I never looked back. Oh, my goodness. You wait till you see gladiators. There's people who are strong. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> oh my yeah. God. So, do you remember the first time you watched it on TV? I do. I remember thinking, I've never seen anything like this. And it was fascinating. I went back and I watched the Netflix documentary. Have you watched that? Muscles and Mayhem about. <laughs> oh, Muscles and Mayhem. I, 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 I'm bit, I held off because I didn't want it to skewer my conversation with you today. <laughs> well, I watched it just before we started hosting Gladiators. And I loved it because when I first saw Gladiators, I remember thinking, there was nothing like this on television. You've got to remember this was before reality TV had even been invented, right? So here we've got people beating the living daylights out of each other, but there was like music and lights and it was like entertainment and sport. No one had ever done that before. So like I was a little bit older. I was like a late teens, early 20s when it first came out and I was just spellbound because I will always, I'll watch any sport on telly. And to see this combined with music and action and you know, big American style production was amazing. But that Muscles and Mayhem documentary, they played some reactions when it first came out in America in the 80s. And there were people going, this is the end of television. There is television, it's going to kill television, right? So it was so good to watch it to then go, oh my God, I'm, I'm part of something that's been around for 40 yeah. or 50 years. It's really exciting to think that, like, you know, it's not just a, a television show that we're making. We're actually, there's this long history about, how it came about and, you know, what were the, what happened to the original gladiators and how it affected their lives. And, I mean, happily now that there's a lot more safety and a lot more security <laughs> around what they do compared to what they did in the 80s. But, yeah, it was it was mind-blowing the first time I saw it. Do you remember what it was like, what your thoughts were when you saw it? I, the first time I saw it was I was out at the Brisbane Entertainment Centre watching a tape. Oh, so you watched it live. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we were working for the radio station. We were part of getting the audience there. It was bananas. It was absolutely bananas. People compared it to, at the time, was called World Championship Wrestling or WWF. Mm -hmm. It's no longer that. But, you know, your your Hulk Hogan's and later on your your John Cena's and your Rocks, et cetera. But it's different in that with wrestling, there's the kayfabe, there's the the agreement that we'll never give, we'll ask you to believe this yeah. is all real and our part of the deal is we'll never give you a reason to believe that it isn't. So Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin are probably great mates, but they never arrived to the stadium together. Yeah. But with Gladiators, you've got all of that kayfabe against punters. Yeah. And so that that thing doesn't exist. It doesn't. And you know what the fascinating thing is? Within about three minutes of starting to film, Bo and I realised that the punters are contenders who are taking on the gladiators. Like we've got all this entertainment and stuff that we're just trying to be a bit silly and a bit entertaining. But then at the heart of it, for these contenders, this is their World Cup. This is their moment, right? So they go to the gym, they're fit. Some of them are really super fit. Some of them are are sort of mum fit or dad fit. But for, for them to be able to turn up and take on these gladiators, it is a huge moment. So... We, we, we realised really early that we had to respect that and lean into that a bit. So it's quite a nice tension between like the entertainment and the fun and the fact that for these contenders, this is their biggest moment and they want to, they've got their family and friends there and they want to show them what they're capable of, which was actually a really nice thing to sort of be part of. And some of the contenders, you'll see it as you watch it, 
They're so emotional. You can see what it means to them to be there. When you saw, you know, you you see the gladiators where that their stage name when they show up to work in their, you know, their Hilux or whatever they show up in, and then they get in the gear. Do you see the transformation when they become the the thing? Yeah, and it, it actually took a few days. It wasn't sort of immediate that transformation, but eventually it was really quick. They and they'd get their makeup on and you know, and then they would become a new person. But the first couple of days. We decided to call them only by their gladiator names. So we knew that their real names. We thought, nah, we've got to call them by their gladiator names or else if we call them by their gladiator names during the show, during filming, it won't sound right. So the first few yeah. days we were like, g'day, Cyclone, g'day, Chaos, whatever. And they were like, huh, hi, and a bit sort of sheepish about it. By the end they were like, yep, g'day, how you doing? Like they really embodied. And as the um, filming went on, you could see they were like, they went from answering to their names to owning it and then as soon as they got their armour on, they were like, shh, different human. And then they take their armour off shh, and you see them in the cow park and they were just, well, they're normal in a superhuman way. Like you don't see chaos walking through the car park and think she's just like the rest of us. She's like the strongest woman you've ever seen walking through a car park in her leisure way. I, I love that the, you had the idea of that you had the gift of not being as, not being the best. And so you had to work very, very hard to overcome that. I want, I want to come back to that in a minute. But you get to work with someone who is probably one of the hardest working, most focused humans I've ever met, Bo Ryan. Uh, had you met Bo before? I actually hadn't. I've met him very briefly and said hello to him and that's it. And then when we first met each other, it was like straight away, like we just got on really well. And you know what's funny about Bo? He's so hardworking and he's so focused and he really has done his research and he understands his craft and he understands the edits. It takes you a long time to figure that out because he's got this front of being this playful puppy that just wants to jump around and say hello and lick your face and run off and get scratches behind the ear from someone else. And, like, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First time I met him, I'm like, this guy's amazing but he's got way too much energy and he's got the attention span of a gnat. Like, this is not going to go well. But then you realise that that is exactly how his attention span works because he takes everything in and then he runs off and gets some, some sort of information from someone else and then someone else and then comes back and puts it all together and does it in an instant. And he's an absolute joy to work with, but he and I couldn't be any more different in the way we approach our work. Like I like to work in a linear fashion. He's just all over the shop. So I think it works with us. And really my job was yeah. just to laugh at him as it <laughs> As we finished off, because he's just so. Funny. You're right. He does, and, and you're very right. He he is like a gigantic staffy mm -hmm. puppy, but it is when I've worked with him, it is by design. You're absolutely right. He understands what he's trying to craft in the edit. He understands what yeah. the people who are ultimately going to put this on air need, and he works to give them as many options as he possibly can. He gives himself edit points. You might not realise what he's doing if you don't know what to look for, but once you have an understanding of how these things work, you're like, holy moly, man, you are, you are good. He's very good. And he actually, and like I've worked in television for like 25 years, but I've never worked on an entertainment show. So to have him sitting next to me was so good because he taught me so much about working in entertainment. Like I've done, I've worked in entertainment before, but it's been comedy, panel shows and that sort of thing. And I've obviously hosted sports, live sport and sort of sports panel shows, but never have I done anything like this, hosting entertainment. And to have him standing next to me, within a couple of days I realised he was such a security blanket because he not only knows what he's talking about, but he's, again, there's that, remember I talked about information sharing? He's got a team sport background, so he wants to share information. He wants to make us both better, not just make him better, because he knows that if we're both better, the show's better. So... You know, yeah. he, that's what he was so good at for me. And that's why, like, we had some really long days. Like some days I'd get there at seven for hair and makeup and we would clock off at midnight or 1am. Oh, I know them. Oh, boy. You know, like, yeah. you know what's that, what that's like. And, like, yeah. you know that you've got to be chirpy for the camera at half past 12 in the morning. And so having Bo next to me was actually really great because we are feeding off each other and, like as if you're in a grand final. Come on, last five minutes, let's go, let's do this, let's nail it. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I'm very blessed to have worked with some of the people that made that show with you. And um, I know some of the people in the truck are the greatest 
that have ever done it, yeah. have ever, ever done Just it in amazing. Australia. So, you know, if the show falls over, it's not their fault. It's probably my fault. That's okay. Oh, people. Everyone blames. No, but it's, it is. It's, it's, uh, and it's what I tell people all the time. And I think Will Anderson puts it quite well when he talks about something like Gruen. He says, I'm just the guy who's the pilot of the plane, but it doesn't go anywhere if everyone doesn't do their job. Yeah. I'm just the one that people see and say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that's so true. It's so true. And the people behind the scenes, eventually you're, you're trying to make them laugh, like when we're doing stuff to oh, camera. Yeah. You got to think about who your audience is. So we were just trying to make them laugh, trying to make the directors and the producers and everyone else laugh. That's all we cared about. Oh, if I get a chuckle out of a camo, I mean, oh my god, yes, you know. well, camos are the hardest, aren't they? You know, and actually, I will say oh, this: I've seen one, <laughs> they're so hard to crack. When we realised that the camos were actually invested in in the events, in the actual the games, and they wanted to see what happened, we're like, oh, I reckon this show might work because if the camos are interested. <laughs> Yeah. As you mentioned, it, it is it is this idea of, you know, it's why people, why do people run a marathon? You know, you're one of 15,000 people who run, the, no, sorry, 100,000 people who run the Sydney, uh, the, uh, the city of surf in Sydney. Like, you're not going to win it. You run it so you, you can sit there in your job and go, I did that yeah. and I nailed it and I feel better about myself and I can face things. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, whatever prize, I don't know if there's a prize for your, you know, season of the Gladiators. Well, there's a prize. They get to become Gladiators next season. And that was really ah. motivating. That was super motivating for all of them because they, like, all yeah. of them, well, there it is. Yeah. But they all knew that only one of them would get there. And for so many of them, you're so right. It was just, it was about turning up and testing themselves to see what they what they could do, physically understanding, you know that at that level, you, where where else are you going to get a chance to compete physically like that if you don't have a career in the I don't know like the NRL or you're in you know BJJ in some competitive capacity or or something like you're never going to be that physical and be tested in an environment in a kind of safe way ever. No, and, so yeah, and it's not just yeah. physical testing; it's mental testing; it's the ability to do the warm-up, to do your event, to go away, to cool down, have an hour off, to have time to think about it, okay, come and warm up for the next event, and to do that six or seven times in a day for, like, you could see towards the end it was really tiring and really taxing for the contenders. But so the mental strength required to do that, I think they all, probably, they all would have gone away and learned what they're capable of just a little bit more. Now, I've seen some of the promos. Some of your glads are big humans. What? Is the catering tent life? <laughs> Busy. Lots of carbs, lots of protein. So the Glads got their own food, which was very like, oh, I could tell the story and pretend, yeah, they just got fed raw meat, just got thrown in and they all just. Yeah, you know, it's boiled chicken and broccoli. We know what it is. It's the same thing that everyone eats. Exactly what it it's was. broccoli, chicken and rice. Yeah, exactly. It's so dull. It was just people like In me, a giant lunchbox and, um, and then an hour and a half later again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so, it's horrific. So Lots of protein shakes, like boxes and boxes of supplements and stuff, you know, coming in. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, they ate plenty. Now, I've got to apologise. I've got kids running around behind me. I'm the only responsible adult in the house at the moment. So it's all right. It's all a part of it. <laughs> I, I, Wolf comes in and sits on my lap sometimes. It's okay. Like it's all, it's all part of the thing. This is what the, this is the show. This is what we do. It's this so is true. what life is, you know? Messy. It's totally, totally, totally fine. When, as someone who, you know, you've worked in a job where you're a professional athlete, your gig, is to push yourself physically as hard as possible and mentally as hard as possible uh, in a sustainable way so you are as sharp at the final whistle uh, as you could possibly be and then do it again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. When you're seeing on those long days, when you're seeing the gladiators, when you're seeing the contenders, were you noticing like, oh, man, that far out, that person is cooked? Yeah. Because you, you know what to look for. Yeah, you could see. And you can see it in – just the way they hold their shoulders and the way they like they're looking around. If if you're not cooked, you're like you're up, you're about, you're focused. And um, there's a real skill in reversing your body language. So when when you're up and when you're feeling good, there's certain things you do with your body. You know, you're up and you're about and you're chatty for me and got things to say. And then when I'm not feeling good, I'm sort of a bit like this. And you can trick yourself into feeling good by performing those that body language first, and your body and your head goes, 
oh, I must be feeling good because she's up and she's about and she's chatty, right? And there were some contenders who were a bit like that. You could see them, they were tired, but they'd make themselves physically get themselves up and then the mental stuff would follow. And then there were some contenders who you could just see it. They were like, they were tired. They just didn't want to be there towards the very, very end because they were sore. They'd been pummeled all day. They still got up and competed, but not perhaps as well as they would have if they weren't feeling so tight. So there's only a couple of contenders who we really thought, yeah, they're, they're cooked. And But most of them, I think the adrenaline of being on the show was enough to sort of get them up and about. But that is really quite quite the trick. In tricking Isn't that fascinating that we, we, think, we think we're so – you know, clever and we're the master of our own, you know, ca- carapace or the master of our own, but no, we're just really quite simple. We, we, you can hypnotize us like a hypnotizer chicken. <laughs> like literally what you're saying. If yeah. you look up, you're, you're sending your, your body signals to release the, I feel okay. Yeah. Even if you don't, your body doesn't matter. No. Doesn't care. And you know, that was one of the things I learned <laughs> when I was playing, because when I was playing well, you know, I went and looked at what my body language was like when I was playing well. And then when I wasn't playing well and I picked the differences and then when I wasn't playing well, I'd start to think, okay, well, without thinking, without thinking I need to play well because that's a really hard thing to do. I'm going to think about the things that I can control. What's my body language doing when I'm playing well? Well, I'll do these things. And then you, your head goes, oh, well, I must be playing well. Off we go. Let's get the intercept or let's do what we've got to do. It's quite a trick. Isn't and that it? did the job? It worked for me. Maybe I'm simple. Wow. No, no, but what you've descri- what you've just described is is so f- and you did it so matter of factly, which I love. But you what you what can you control? You can't control the opposition, you can't control your other teammates to you know to a point. All you can control is yourself. And understanding that your body just needs the cues that it otherwise gets when things are going well. So well, I'll give these things because I can do this, and then my brain will just go, Oh, it must be yeah, okay, I'll go for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a <laughs> there it is. trick. Yeah, it worked. It works. Alex with the intercept. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> exactly. What's it? What's something that you wish people knew about sports commentators? Like, like was Laser Punter watching? I'm just hearing you, and no, I know enough about how the sausage is made to understand. I think they must be getting talked to. There's enough action going on the screen, so they've been quiet now, and then they show up with you. It was quite a pass, wasn't it? Let's have a look at it because they've just been told the replay's there and then they cut to the replay. What are some things that people just have no idea about goes on in a commentary box? How bloody hard it is. Like, that's the thing that really stunned me because you think as a play, you're like, oh, bloody commentators, they're not saying this, they're not saying that. But when you're there, you're so focused. You, if you're not watching what's on the screen, so sometimes you might be watching over here where the actual action is. So what I'm seeing is not what the viewer's seeing. So that's actually quite the skill to make sure that you don't get caught up in watching the action, but you make sure you watch what the viewer's seeing because sometimes I'll be looking over here at the action and what the viewers see is different and I wouldn't react. So that actually was quite the skill to learn to get to call what was on the screen, not what I was looking at at the time. And sometimes, or mostly it's the same thing. But So that's really hard work. But the other thing is, is just, like I commentated a lot with my best friend, Kath Cox, and we would sometimes just totally lose our shit just laughing and have to put the microphones down and, and everything would go silent. So sometimes things go silent because someone said something that's sort of in joke and we would just be crying with laughter. And if you had a headset on, you had to sort of hold the microphone on so you wouldn't. <laughs> so, but my husband would know. He'd be like, you two lost it. And I was like, yeah, we would lose it and we would lose it and we're trying not to to laugh out loud, but that would mean that we'd cry and then our makeup and crafts of the makeup ladies would be frantically rambling the makeup when we were doing the piece of camera at the end of the game. It was just so, like it didn't happen often, but sometimes it was so chaotic. And my husband was just appalled at the fact that we were never, Kath and I were never allowed to room together on tour because we were too naughty. What, what do you mean, naughty? Like setting things on fire, naughty? Oh, no. no we, I matured. Gosh, I, you know, I wasn't like nine anymore. Oh, we'd just sit up and talk. We'd do pranks on people. We, I don't know. Hang on a second. What what kind of pranks are we talking here? Oh, <laughs> clad wrap on toilet seats. It's just stupidity, right? Stuff that we should be doing. Hang on, take me through that. So, hang on. You're, you're on the road. You're, you're, by this point, you're a retired player. Yeah. At what point do you go, you know what would be great? Let's glad wrap that person's toilet. Oh, yeah. No, not when we're retired. So th- this is when we are playing together. When we are retired and we are on the road, we just found the best wine bar everywhere we went. 
So everything for us is about a food and wine tour. So we're always about, you know, forget about the game. Our producer will always be like, can you two concentrate on the game? We're like, no, okay, so we've got this really good booking for dinner. Does anyone want to join us? Like for us when we were like it was all about the food and the wine. And then but when we were playing, it was just I don't know, we just always make each other laugh and we play endless games of 500 and we just wouldn't get enough sleep was the problem when we were playing. Uh, so then we like we just couldn't believe that we used to be up, like we, we would get let loose hosting live television on Channel 9. It was like this is just <laughs> obscene. So then, yeah, there's, there were some games where we would just totally lose our shit and laugh till we cried and you can, you can if you know us well enough, you can hear it. So the average person might be thinking, oh, we're letting the game breathe, but... <laughs> We're just laughing too hard to talk. Right. There's moments in your career where you've you've won world championships, you've won gold medals at the Commonwealth Games. How does that differ to being told you're the you're the MVP? You've been MVP four times. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? And um, like MVP was like it's a nice recognition at the end of a season. And there was one that was particularly special when I got named MVP the year after I came back from a knee reconstruction. So I had a knee reconstruction at the end of 2005 and then I was I made it back for the Swifts into the Australian team when I was named MVP at the end of that season. And that was particularly sweet. But when I look back, you know, if someone, if you ask me in 10 seconds to think about the highlights of my career, the MVP awards don't even flash up. The things that flash up in my mind are, winning gold medals, winning World Cups, winning premierships with the Swifts because when I played, like we weren't full-time professionals. The last year I played, I got paid $6,000 for the season from my club (laughs) and I've got expensive tastes. So you can imagine how far that went. And I was the highest paid player at the club. So we weren't doing it for money. We were doing it because we really got on well. And my best friends now are the women who were in that team and we still speak regular I've got a WhatsApp group we're always just messaging random things to each other so for me the, some of the highlights of my career came with my club team as much as with the diamonds because that was with my friends and then the diamonds is the ultimate so I've, I've always been a team player and the team the MVPs are nice and they look great on the CV but they're a very individual thing which is sort of a bit uncomfortable because I play a team sport so for me the biggest things are about the team my highlights are my team. And, you know, some of the highlights are, are just stupid things that happened in hotels or on the bus or at airports, you know, the yeah. funny stuff. <laughs> well, it's shares memories, isn't it? It is, right? I, I was adjacent to um, professional surfing for a little while, about three years or so. I was aghast at the prize money on offer for the same waves in the same conditions, well, very close to similar conditions, what they were, women were being expected to paddle out into um, versus the men. It's, it's getting to be different now. You know, as a professional athlete, as someone who's paid six, you know, get this super high profile, you're on TV or you get paid six grand. You know, the people know you, people stop you at the shops. You're like, no, that's, that, I, that's, that's, that's my money to take my family to the nice hotel room when I go on holiday, not the other one, but we pay for the airfare. When you watched this year, when you watched what happened with the, the soccer, when you watched the way the nation was captivated by the Matildas, what did that, what did that mean to you? I often find myself at the moment being feeling really emotional about that sort of stuff. You know, I'll even go back to the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast in 2018 and my little girl plays netball and rugby and back then she wanted to go and watch the Rugby Sevens and we went to watch the Rugby Sevens at the Gold Coast and we sat in the stadium and the women ran out and the stadium was packed. 30,000 people cheered and I just started to cry. She's like, Mummy, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't know, right? And then when I watched the Matildas, I'm getting teary thinking about it now. Like, you watch the Matildas and what happens with them. You know, I recall the days of playing in front of 200 people for us and then now you know, they get 200 people to watch them train for the netballers. And, you know, the Swifts, this year I went to the preliminary final and there was 12,000 people cheering them on. So I love where we are. I watched the Matildas and I thought I'm so, I was so excited and so happy. But a little voice in the back of my head is saying, was saying, what's netball doing about this? We're going to get swamped if we're not careful. And, you know, netball has a fantastic grassroots run by women who could run the army. They're so good logistically, but we just don't seem to have that plan about how we make sure that we're not a talent pathway for women's AFL, for the, for the Matildas, for, for, for other professional leagues. And like our sport's got a long way to go, but I think the greatest thing is 
competition is the thing that makes you better. And now there's competition for our athletes, for the eyeballs, for participation. I think in the long run, it's going to be good for my sport because it will make us be sharper and make us be better about our offering. Watching what happened when the Matildas played earlier this year, um, in 2023, when the Matildas played, like for me, it just it just fulfilled the promise of sport in a way that sport played by men didn't for me. Lots of people tell me they feel like the women's version of a male game or a game that's they're used to watching men play is a bit purer. Like it's not so much strength oh. and. So you have to craft your points a bit better or you have to craft your play a bit better and it's a, just a different game. Now, it's a different mindset, isn't it? There's not this whole idea of, well, men's sport is the norm and then the little ladies get to play. Now we're understanding that the way men play a sport is one way to play it but an equally interesting but different way to play a sport is how the women play it and there's marketability and profit to be made and awesome athletes in both. So let's embrace both. Some of the most, you know, if you think about the great highlights, you know, it's one thing you mentioned rugby sevens. It's one thing to watch a humongous hit in a rugby game. And then if you're over a certain age or if you've ever been hit like that, like it gets uncomfortable the more times you watch it. Like, oh, like <laughs> that man's not going to remember his children's name when he's 40. You know, that's oh, it's not good. Yet the thing that you really want to see is that just in football, particularly like in rugby, that extraordinary kind of fake dummy that has a defender just look the wrong direction and the person sidesteps them, that super cerebral yep. play that is a mix of agility, flexibility, and athleticism, that's the thing you just go, wow, that takes your breath yeah. away. Like I think there's room for all of it. My husband um, played rugby and like he will watch all sports, but, you know, people would say to him, oh, you got to go and watch netball. And he's like, Mate, if you think about it like that, you're missing something. It's a great sport to watch. So, you know, he would out, go out every Friday night to watch me play. He had his mates out there. They'd all sit at the bar and have a beer and really just enjoy watching the spectacle. And I think once you let your biases go, there's a whole world of sport out there that you're not seeing until you let your biases go. And the great thing is now, and you think about the Matildas, for so many years netball has been sort of out on its own, trying to forge a path saying it's okay and it's great to watch women play sport. Now instead of being the exception, it's what part of the norm, you know, women playing sports. So I actually, you know, I say this often, I'd love to get to a point where we stop talking about women's sport and we just talk about sport. Sometimes it's played by men, sometimes it's played by women, but it's sport, right? Because at the moment we talk about sport and then we talk about women's sport. And so that's just saying that, well, the normal is the men and, well, and here's the women also having a go. But if we're just talking about sport generally and we get rid of the term women's sport, then like that would be unreal. We're a little way off it yet, but well, I think we're getting there. And the the world, the women's World Cup, and the Matildas took us a long way forward. Sports just a, an agreement that this particular group of people from this particular geographic area in this particular coloured shirt, it's very important that they get that ball that doesn't bounce properly over there, and eighty thousand people will pay a ticket to watch it. <laughs> That's so funny, isn't it? When you make it simple, you're like, what? Sport's so weird. I, I, look, I think it is the storytelling. You know, I, I went to watch my little girl play in a rugby tournament this year. It was in Western New South, Central Western New South Wales, and it was a school's rugby tournament. She was representing North Coast. And whilst I was watching young women play rugby, a little boy ran past with his mate and he had a Sam Kerr shirt on. And I thought, oh, my God, this is just like there's so much about this that is so inverted from when I was a kid. But I think it is the storytelling. You know, that whole World Cup was about the story of the Matildas. Sam Kerr is a great story. And I think, you know, all the research tells us that fans of women's sport want to hear the stories. They attach to the stories as much as the action. And so we've just got to get used to being vulnerable, telling our stories, selling our stories. It's one thing to tell it, but to sell it is another thing. To tell our stories in a marketable, marketable sort of way is really important as well. And, and people might blanch at what you use the word marketing, but let's not forget the $6,000 paycheck, uh, you know, a couple of zeros on that. How much is a knee? <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, it's, you're, you're asking a lot of these athletes, you're asking a lot of athletes, a lot of their bodies, of for them to put their bodies through for it's a, yeah. a very small playing window. It is. When you, when you, um, had kids, I don't know, you know, fertility and infertility is a part of your story. You know, as you're getting, carrying the weight of a pregnancy, were your knees like, mate, we are not going to let you forget all that parquetry? 
<laughs> no, actually, I touch touch all the woods. I wasn't too bad. I loved being pregnant. I thought I just loved it. And I was fascinated because I had this athletic career. I was fascinated to see what else my body could do. I was so used to it being fast and strong and agile. And suddenly it was growing a human. I was like, whoa, this is amazing. So I think I just, you know, felt what most women feel when they're pregnant by the end. You just, you feel like an elephant. You just want to get the, get the baby out. But no, I was okay. Um, the thing that my playing career had the biggest impact on was the age that I was having kids. So things are so different now. Like netball has really great maternity leave provisions and, you know, but back when I was playing, I always felt that if I had time off to have a kid, I might not get back in the team or it might just be an interruption to, um, to my playing. And there wasn't the support around. Whereas now if, if you're in a club team and you have a kid, you have a baby, you know, the club will pay for a carer to fly with you so that your baby can be looked after while you're traveling and all that. Like, it's like, it's so vastly different. And because the impact on me was I played till I was 34 and I had a couple of years off after I finished playing, just traveling and having a normal life with my husband. And then because I'd spent like 15 or 16 years living this high performance athlete lifestyle where it's not just nine to five, it's 24 seven. And as you say, it's for not much money. So I had sort of four years where I went, right, I'm going to live a life like a normal person. I'm actually going to earn like a decent amount of money, you know, for my family. And then we had my daughter when I was 38 and we fell pregnant with her really easily. And then it took us five years five cycles of IVF, wow. three miscarriages to have my son, Austin, and that was a massive impact on me. And when I had my final miscarriage, I was 41, and I just grieved for months because I thought I've just left things too late. And my husband kept saying to me, it's okay, you had things on, you know, you're winning World Cups. And I was like, nah, I give them all up just to have a baby now, just to have our second child. And he was like, well, you're being ridiculous. I'm like, no, I don't want to right. So it, I was so emotional. But I wish that we were educated. Like, yeah, there's so much education, so much time and energy put into this education, particularly at school, about how to not fall pregnant. <laughs> and we, as women, we actually don't really know how it all works and how our bodies work, right? So it was like I was 40 and I was researching things and I was like, oh, right, that's what that's about. So... You know, this is going to become an issue as female athletes play for longer and longer as their careers extend because the money's there now, so they'll play it for as long as they can. When I was playing, most of the girls retired at, in like at 30 and I went on to 34 and that was considered <laughs> I was a bit old. But there's girls who will play for much longer because the money's there and they can look after their bodies and they can recover properly and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's something that every sport needs to think about addressing and educating its players on is about your peak, you your window of fertility when you you know you in your peak period of fertility and how, what steps you can take to make sure that when you retire that's still available to you or the sports need to take on the responsibility of offering maternity leave and making sure that players have the opportunity to start their families during their playing career if they like i couldn't agree more with that you know audrey and i certainly found that and in her words she's like i'm an islander i get pregnant very easily um, <laughs> So off, off I went, and I'm sure your husband and I can relate. It's a very strange room you need to go into. It's very, very odd. There's no lock on the door. It's really weird. And yeah. um, sure the magazines enough. Magazines are a bit. Yeah, sure enough. Motility was not my strong suit. And, ah. you know, I, I'll tell any man that listens, yeah, just because you can have kids as a man later on, doesn't make it a great idea. Like fast forward to 21, like add 21 years to when you get pregnant. How old are you going to be? When that kid's 14 and you need to be rough and tumble and tussle and physically match him or her, how old are you going to be? Are you going to be able to do it? Because uh, I do, you know, I, that's the reason I, I went through all the surgery. I went through. It was like, I'm going to be in my mid 60s when Wolfie's finishing high school. And I want to be, I want to be there. I want to be vital. I want to be there for it. Yep, totally. I had mates who had old dads who just sat in a chair. That was it. And I saw how it impacted their life because there wasn't that kind of person that was there to coach, essentially. Coach them through their coach, life. Coach, play, throw the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, totally. And, you know, we think about that now. Matthew and I go to Pilates like mad people because we like we want to be a, a ba- able to play with our kids. Like, I'm 50, but I've just been out this morning doing a circuit with my little girl. Because, like, 
us training together, it's when you get to talk, right? So we're yeah. not looking at each other in the eye. Music's playing. You know, in, in the rest period we have little snatches of conversation and that's when you, you really know what your kids are thinking, not sitting down, yeah. having a proper conversation with them. It's actually oh, yeah. doing the activity. And certainly as they become teen- as they become teenagers, you got to have those conversations like when they're ready. And <laughs> you do a lot of talking in the car. Uh, yeah, well, oh, no. Driving to water polo is when I was going to get my, a lot of my chats done. You know? Yeah, exactly right. So that's And that's why you, you want your kids playing sport because you yeah. do do it. Like we've had... My God, we've covered so many thousands of kilometres this year driving Evelyn around to netball and rugby, but that's when you get it's when you get your conversations happening, right. you know. We're driving my little boy to cricket every weekend. It's like, yeah, this is our time to talk. I would not I wouldn't change it for the world. I would I'm grateful to give my weekends to kids sport. Totally. That's the best thing. You know, people talk about the amount of time you spend and I'm like, Oh, I love it. I want my kids to play all the sports. We're at every night of the week. Wednesday nights have one day off because we're at training or playing and like I know the lessons that they're getting is awesome on one level, but as you know, the relationship that you form with your kids when you're part of their activities either, like I coach my little girl, but Matthew helps him with his cricket, with Austin with his cricket. So you just can't get that back and that's just the the greatest way to spend time with your kids. And seeing them do something that they love and that they get a kick out of and that they learn from is amazing. Speaking of being a, a, a kid and being interested in being physical and being in a team, you mentioned about when you were in, in high school that you you weren't as good as everyone else. And what did that give you and what did that set you up for? It set me up for working harder than everybody else. And even academically, I was never first. I was always second or third or fourth. It always gave me something to work towards. So then when I became the best, I still trained like I was second or third best. So that the ability to put your head down and your bum up, sometimes you need something in front. Like I'm the sort of person I need something in front of me to make me try and catch them. Some people don't need that, but I certainly needed that. So when I was younger, it, that actually gave me the work ethic. I had the desire and I had the competitive nature, but the thing that underpins everything is your work ethic. So I had the work ethic and I also had an attitude of I'm going to show them what I'm made of, right? And that still that still sits in the back of my head now. I still feel like I'm showing people what I'm made of or what I can do. You know, I'm 50 years old and I'm hosting gladiators. Oh, I've got to show people what I can do. Oh, I mean, people know what I can do. That's why I've got the job. But that that mindset of the hard work, showing up every day, working a little bit harder than yesterday, working a little bit harder than the person who's in front of you has always held me in really good stead. I think sometimes if you're like, I play with kids who are really naturally gifted athletes and they never had to develop the work ethic until they were in their late teens and by then it was too late. Yeah, I can't control the market. I can't control who makes what. And I said it to Georgia when she was studying for her HSC. It was something that my old manager, John Ferreter, once said to me, only you know how hard you've worked to make your dreams come true. And that stuck with me so hard because I'm the one that has to lie in bed at night when I didn't get the gig or didn't get the job or did a bad day. And people go, it's fine, mate. I'm the one that has to lie there myself going, you find it in, mate. You fucking find it in. You know you can do better than that. Mm, we're going to remind you of that all night long. <laughs> <laughs> and if you dare fall asleep, we'll wake you up and remind you of that. And it's so true, right? Like when I look at my television career, I laugh at my television career, right, because I wasn't pretty at school. I wasn't, you know, whatever. But here I am, I'm 50, I've got silver hair and I'm still on television. And one of the big things is that I show up, I'm prepared, I have a good attitude, I try and work with people, I try not to be a diva. Like all the things that you actually don't see on the screen, the things that happen off the screen are the things that make you good at what you do. And like our industry finds out very quickly people who who don't want to play as part of the team, who don't want to understand what, you know, people who just want to fly the plane without the without the flight engineers and the mechanics and all that, without looking after them. So, like, it is about your attitude, your work ethic, what what you what you do before you actually get on screen and say hello and welcome is equally as, if not more, important than what you do when you're on the screen when the camera's on. And that's all within your control. You don't have to. You don't need anybody's permission to put that work in. Yep, yeah, totally. And, you know, I've got a little saying that I learned when I was little. I miss out on an under-13s rep team or under-12s rep team. My mum gave me this little saying, if it is to be, it's up to me. And it's such a good thing because, like, you can fail and you can blame someone else and go, 
they didn't do that. The umpires made the wrong call. They employed the wrong person. But, you know, like you say that and you lose control of changing it. So you, you want to be, if it is to me, so I'm the only person who, who can control my destiny, my reactions, my attitude. Liz Ellis, I cannot wait to hear the fantastic words, gladiators ready. <laughs> I just can't wait. I just can't wait because it's preposterous. I love it. It is preposterous. I love it. It's completely, why should it be any different than a game like AFL, which is like, no one's even on, everyone's all over the field. No, like there's too many goalposts. The ball doesn't bounce properly. I don't know what's happening. Why are you running? Why are you bouncing? Who knows? But we've all agreed that it's a good idea. Why should it be any different that these people in fantastic Tim Chapel costumes climbing up a big pyramid with broomsticks <laughs> shouldn't be just as important? It should be. It's as, <sighs> it's as ridiculous. Yeah, and then there's a little comedic Bo and me on the side who don't have any muscles and we're just trying to be funny. I oh, don't say that to Bo. He works very hard. <laughs> oh, he does actually. He does. We just laughed at him because he works very hard, but then he stood next to Phoenix and we are like, mate, <laughs> you struggling. Well, you, I mean, I think, you know, if you watch Bo during his NRL career, even when he was at his playing weight, so some, some, I'm one of them, some blokes, unless you do certain things, you just don't get massive. Some yeah. people, though, their bodies just get massive. <laughs> yeah, and the ones that do get massive end up as gladiators and the ones that don't end up hosting. <laughs> you're a dream. Thank you so much for your time. And, um, Thanks, you're, you're the best. What a, what a great day. Thank you so much. It's just so lovely to connect with you. And so I'll make sure I tell Audrey you said hey. Yeah, tell Audrey hello and tell her I think of her every time I yell at Evelyn and say, Evelyn, Audrey! <laughs> <laughs>